I'm going to start my story off tonight with a little bit of a personal story. About 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, on the front page of the Globe and Mail, lower right-hand corner, there was a little article about this big. And it talked about people my age. I'm now 60. This is my 60th year. But when I was a kid, according to this article, I spent about 80% of my, my spare, unstructured time outside messing around in by the coolies, in the, in, by the pond, down by, down by the creek, or in the woods. F in my case, we had about 20 hectares of, of woods right nearby, and uh, I, I sort of grew up in those woods. I didn't really like school. And I used to sit in the classroom looking out the window, dreaming about what I was going to do in those woods after I finished. My fort was my life, and building my fort. Uh, but it also was where I was introduced to photography, uh, which slowed me down, and birds, which opened up a whole new avenue of exploration. And it just, it was, it was my takeoff point. Having that woodlot nearby, from my perspective, was really a lifesaver. It was a place where I found uh, peace with myself. It was a, a place where I found tranquility. Uh, it was a place where I found enjoyment and fun. Uh, and and I, I, I think that I'm just one of the lucky ones that managed to happen in on that. But as life went on, and then I got busy working uh, in the workaday world, which obviously is, was, has been a conservation career all my life, it's, it, I, the, the, the importance of forests just became that much more clear to me. So for your homework tonight, uh, you have a book that you have to read. It's called Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louv. Who here has read it, just out of curiosity? Yeah, look at that. Okay, so you know how many more there are to read. Uh, and, and his latest book uh, is called The Nature Principle, which is more focused towards adults. But basically, in this book, Richard Louv talks about the fact that we need to get outside more. And he actually uh, went into schools across North America and asked kids where they like to play. And overwhelmingly, the answer kept coming back, I like to play indoors. And the reason why, that's where the electrical plug-ins were. We have a big problem. The kids aren't getting outside. They're not switching on. They're not tuning in to nature. They're getting very good at using their thumbs, but it's not ultimately leading them to be to where they need to be. As I tell kids, really all we are as human beings are upright, well-dressed, big-brained gophers. <laughs> that's all we are, because we need the same thing that every vertebrate, every mammal needs on this planet, and that's clean air, clean water, and productive soil. And without that, we lose it all. And without the connection to it and a connection to understanding it, we'll never get it. And that's what I worry about now with this next generation. So from a societal perspective, the importance of forest can't be underestimated. When I was in West Africa a number of years ago, I did a volunteer project, and that was my first indication that these reserves, these protected areas can be so much more uh, than, than uh, uh, national parks uh, or other protected landscapes. There can actually be a re religious connotation to it. They're called sacred forests or sacred groves. And the sacred forests uh, uh, may account to about 8% of the world's land landscapes. 8% of the world's landscapes may actually be controlled by religious components, and that's according to a study by Oxford University. Oxford University has been tabulating the biological importance of, of, the, uh, of these sacred groves uh, and figuring out how much they're contributing to keeping the biological integrity into the landscape. In in uh, uh, China, for instance, there are thousands of sacred groves. In Japan, there's one sacred grove alone that's 1,500 hectares. In West Africa, outside of the national parks, the only place that has any significant wildlife are in the sacred groves, at least in Ghana, in West Africa. And these sacred groves, many of them have been put aside hundreds of years ago by individuals called Tindanis, which are the land priests. It's sort of like an environment minister with serious power. And these uh, landscapes have been put aside for various religions, religious reasons, but it wasn't until my wife and I started exploring Ethiopia where I realized how much these landscapes, uh, how much biology depends upon these sacred groves. In Ethiopia, which became a Christian country uh, at about uh, 300 AD, uh, landscapes started to be set aside for temples and churches to be built and to be designated as a sacred grove according to the designation, it needs to have a, re a religious component uh, facility within the center of it. So they would build these areas, 
and sometimes preserve forests around them. Some of these forests may only contain a few trees, others can be hectares in size. And what they've worked out, the Oxford University team who's analyzing these areas, there are 35,000 of them in Ethiopia alone. And many of these are forests that haven't been cut since 300 AD. So they've been protected and the biology is significant. So I thought what I would do is finish off with a, a little bit of an insight into an Ethiopia that you probably don't know. And what I hope that this sort of brings across is the importance of this attitudinal change that we need to have towards our landscapes. We need to look at these wild landscapes as, uh, and respect them for their intrinsic value. Up till now, our society has bought and sold nature. I think it's time to put that concept aside. This, by the way, is a Bali Mountain monkey, which are endemic to Ethiopia. There's the colobus monkey found in forests throughout Africa, but this colobus monkey is unique with its uh, unique cape. This is called a grivet, which is related to the vervet monkey, but it's Ethiopia's own. And these are some of the high elevation plateaus uh, that are surrounded by forests that have animals like this. This is the mountain Niala, found only in Ethiopia, found nowhere else in Africa, unique to that landscape and abundant in the right forests. Now this is the Simeon Plateau, which is now a, an area of hydrological importance. It's actually called the, the water tower of Africa because about a half dozen large rivers emanate from these highlands. I happen to be there during the time of the year in early September when the ibex uh, well, it was like sort of Friday night in high school. The testosterone was going through the roof and I could sneak up to these animals every time they locked horns until I was virtually right beside them and they ignored me completely and watching the battles persist was quite something. But that population of those uh, uh, ibex are only found in Ethiopia. So another one of these endemics. And this was our target species up here. These are our uh, gelata baboons. They're, uh, they're also called the lion baboon because of their the males have that big beautiful cape and that lion-like table tail. But what they do for a living is unique amongst the baboons. They sit on their asses all day long and pluck grass. They're 100% gramnivores. In other words, they eat grass, they eat grass seeds, and they eat grass roots. Here's my wife pretending to pluck grass, and she had some coming right over to check out what this weird gelato was doing. But nevertheless, what I'm trying to get across here is the biological importance of these forested landscapes the, this, and, and the societal understanding of why these landscapes are important, creating protected areas around religious locations for the intrinsic reasons for joyful uh, uh, concepts of getting together and finding uh, peace and tranquility in these areas. And I'm suggesting that what we need to do is look at these wild forested areas and realize that we need to uh, understand them with more of, an, of a, an intrinsic value. And I think Einstein, my wife passed this to me yesterday, in fact, Einstein said, look deep into nature and then you will understand everything better. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.